skating is like meditation. You can just block out any negative thoughts you may have or channel them into skating and release that energy in a way that becomes positive and feels good from your feet to your head. There's nobody telling you what to do or how to do it. You just seek out inspiration, usually without even knowing it, and try and interpret that. I started skating here in my driveway with my brother because he got a skateboard and I just wanted to do whatever he was doing at the time. And then realized a couple of my friends were like on the same tip. Growing up, I was horrible at all the other sports and I was the last dude picked. Didn't have any friends because of it. Skateboarding was exactly what I needed. I just needed to get energy out. I needed to be able to skate whenever I wanted. No rules. Can't tell me what to do. I just go. It was really the freedom. I was always kind of a, a more independent kid, so I liked just being able to hop on a board and, and ride and do, you know, just go wherever and do whatever. You know, the team sports thing wasn't really my thing. And then on top of that, like, getting into music and getting into punk rock. It was a place of acceptance where I didn't need to be a certain kind of person to do it. I could just do it and have my own rules. I grew up in Jericho, Vermont, and next to my house, there was a schoolyard where everybody used to skate. There was this one curb that everybody used to slappy. The older guys, their boards, the tail was completely wood grain because they were just sliding that whole thing. It would just take off a layer of your board eventually. But that was the coolest thing. When we started going to Burlington, the older guys were Oliver Reed, Kyle Burroughs, Greg Fox, huge influence on me. I just got introduced to them through a B-side video, watching at home and then see these guys in the park. Oh, there's that guy, oh, you know, oh, cool. And then a couple years later, I'd be riding for that shop as a little flow guy. If you were downtown, you went to the B-side, see where everybody was, what was going on that day, if there was any pros coming to town, and what spot everybody was skating at. And when we put the ramp in there in that back room, it really became the spot where these kids that did great all summer, they were outside all summer, they were loving the summer months, and then when the weather changed and they couldn't get to the mountain, or it didn't even enter their head because it wasn't something that they could financially afford, it was always skateboarding, so when they had a place inside where they were welcome to come, as opposed to the parking garages where they were constantly being kicked out, it, it really became their, their spot. Vermont, people quit skateboarding for four or five months out of the year. They quit completely, but B-Side Ramp really kept people skating, and that was huge. And it was the first blue ramp with a signature baby blue. It started right there, man. I was working at Eastern Border in Massachusetts and we built a full demo fleet of ramps so we could like load ramps like in the back of a pickup truck and onto a snowmobile trailer and go to a town and put on a demo. And that kind of turned into like towns being like, hey, we, we want a skate park. Like, do you know anyone who could build ramps? And I was like, well, yeah, I, I could build ramps. And the first thing I, I ever built in Burlington was a vert ramp for Burton. I and mean, I came up to build that in like May of 1999. Hannah was the general manager of the B-side at the time, and we ended up at the same dinner, Tuesday night dinner party at Halverson's. This man was there that I hadn't seen before. He had come with a bunch of the regular posse of my crew, and anyways, he went home to Massachusetts after the ramp was done, and we were writing, 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 and ended up becoming a couple. And then we decided, gosh, we really need to do something for these kids for the winter months. Once the weather goes bad, Let's just look in the building, an indoor skateboard park. Burlington had a great skate scene, and there was sort of, oh man, Burlington needs an indoor skate park. Burlington needs an indoor skate park. After talking about it a little bit, like we realized, well, if someone's gonna do it, it should probably be us. So right then, we started writing a business plan. That was probably 99. We saw a street sign that said, for lease, 12,000 square feet. We were like, let's go take a look was perfect. It was exactly what I had envisioned for an indoor skateboard park. Kind of a, just a typical 90s design. It was very linear, just very back and forth. 
You know, we always wanted to do something for everybody. So no matter what kind of a skater you were, there'd be something for you. You know, there was, you know, ramps anywhere from two and a half feet tall to nine feet tall. And there were rails, there were ledges, there was a bowl, there was a half pipe. Always wanted to represent all types of skateboarding. Excitement was building. It was October. We wanted to be open for Christmas. That was our goal. Around the clock, we were working, getting up, going to work, going home, passing out, eating, going. It was this constant stream of just trying to get it done. And I was like, the wallpaper has to go. It was dark green and red. Um, it was just dreary. And I stood on top of that ladder with my scraper in one hand and I'd, I was ironing it with one hand so it would get nice and hot and then scraping it to peel it off. And of course, I lost my balance and fell to my left side of my head onto the cement floor and I was knocked out, gone. Brain injury does change your life. It doesn't have to be for the worst. Sometimes it feels that way. For me, I've learned so much about the world, about people, about our bodies, about empathy and compassion more than I already knew. For me, it's a blessing, I suppose. I got out the end of November. We opened December 21st, I think. Well, maybe December 21st, we stopped painting at like two in the morning and then we opened the next morning at 10 a.m. The ramps were all still wet. Everybody just came in and their wheels turned blue and it was incredible. It was awesome. I do remember being there on the first day talent opened. It was dusty, cloudy, but it was amazing. So many people showed up. People that I looked up to were there. People that were young were there. And it was just massive seeing that first day. Ever since I was 11 years old, that was the spot. I would just be begging my mom to drive, you know, 45 minutes through the snow so I could skate. And all the ramps were painted blue, and it was just like heaven. You walk in there and it was warm. You could get snacks. Uh, all the homies were always there. First time in there is kind of intimidating. I don't think it was very long after they opened before I ended up getting uh, a season's pass there and just being, uh, you know, a young hellion, being there like open to close every day. From the moment we opened it, the place was nuts. It was packed. People come from Rutland. We had people come from St. Johnsburg, Plattsburgh, West Lebanon. You know, you'd see everybody all the time. I could go to work and that was like the place to be. And that, that was kind of cool. The thing about talent that really expanded the community was the young guys. Chris Holden was one of them. He was so pale because he was in talent so much. He was just inside all the time. And his progression was exponential. I was pretty nervous to go at first, I remember. It took me like six months to go after it opened because I was just like, I don't know, socially awkward at that point. I still kind of am, but that place really like took me out of my shell once I finally did get in there and realized that it's just a whole indoor space of people trying to figure life out like me, sharing these little joys through skateboarding. So my brother and I really got really close skating talent um, together. He would do fakie and I would do nolly. So it really looked like the same exact trick, but for us it played off different strengths and weaknesses and we were able to really push each other and learn from each other. Sean Stem, like Connor Rose, the whole crew of people there were just like really eclectic and different. So, you know, I felt like I would fit in amongst a bunch of people that don't fit in, you know? Like Marshall Heath, Dave Hebert, Sean Stem, Kyle Burroughs. We just gained so much inspiration from them. You don't need to be like a pro skater in like Barcelona. Those big videos were inspiring too growing up, but almost like out of reach. I would prefer it at the time, like Colin Hale's part in Piece of Time that Travis Card and Luke Sullivan made. Just like freestyling around town, goofing off of his friends at spots I could recognize. And then Danny Hopkins came into my life and made a few videos of his own. His first project was in like eighth grade. It was his eighth grade project. It was called the PETA Project, which stands for pain in the ass. Super funny. But that was like the first time anyone had ever filmed me. We were like skating around Maple Tree Place. 
sometimes you're filming something and like you know your own potential but it takes having like a camera and a group of friends around to really push you to do that which I'm incredibly grateful for because I can now look back on plenty of instances that I was scared shitless to do something but I was motivated and egged on by those friends to do it and it worked out or it didn't work out and I learned a valuable lesson <laughs> you're gonna miss all the shots you don't take I'm happy I at least tried those scary things and may have failed, may have succeeded, but it's better than not trying, that's for sure. Harold Hunter came, he skated for New York and he did a one man demo because nobody else from New York showed up. And he had been working in a skate shop in New York City for years too. And he said, you know, Hannah, you're gonna love all your skate rats. I can see that already, but you're also gonna lose some of them. I was like, dude, Harold, what are you talking about? And um, he was right, he was right. Sean Stem was like, you know, he was like a son that I hadn't birthed. He was always with me. But he got addicted to junk. And it didn't matter that he was in and out of rehabs. He just couldn't, he just couldn't beat it. And he just lost, he just lost. But he tried so hard and he did earn his own paycheck at Talent. I wouldn't take back a single memory with him for anything in the world. And whenever his posse is here, I always play Take On Me by AHA because he would sing that song so loud and so off key through the entire skate park when he was here. It's Sean's song. So it's okay. In 2008, things really hit a wall and that was the financial collapse of us. We hung on for another decade, even though our dollars were doing worse every year. We kept going because we believed in it. We were passionate about it and probably afraid. Like, what are we gonna do if this place closes down? And what's gonna happen to this kid, this kid, this kid, and this kid who rely on it so much? Until the point where the landlord came and said, rent's going up $2 a square foot. And that was that. Got to skate it down to like the last piece. And then, then like riding into the shop with like no walls. It was definitely emotional to say the least. Like especially seeing like Hannah and Dave go through it after how much time and effort they had put in. I was appreciative for how much it had done for me and like the whole community. I was there the first day they opened. I was there the last day they were open. Man, there's so much has gone in that building. I wouldn't be who I am without those hours of being on the ground and those bloody scabs and all that stuff. But just that hard work, dedication has really changed my life. I mean, I've done things that I thought were impossible. I thought it was impossible. It makes you think about the world differently. Things you think are impossible, you don't really know that. When the place was completely done and empty, I went home and I crawled into my bed. I think I stayed there for about a month, so depressed. I don't know, it was part of me had, had passed away. Somewhere in that darkness, um, in the comfort of my bed, I received a phone call from one of my talent families and they said, hey, Hannah, we want you to come to a meeting. And I was like, I'm bankrupt. Like, I, I'm, I'm toast. They're like, just come, we just wanna talk to you. And I said, okay, I'll come. And I walked in, it was a long table with a bunch of parents of kids who benefited, blossomed through the love of that safe place. And they went around the room and each told the story of their kid and why talent was so important to their family. 
And then at the end, they were like, and by the way, we want, we want to reopen you as a nonprofit and we'll be your board of directors. You'll be the executive director, but we're going to help you. Would you do it? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I don't even know if I thought about it for a second. Wait, I'm going to have a team to work with me? Yes. Let's do it. We were heartbroken for ourselves and really concerned thinking about the skate community and what the skate community was losing and losing talent. But then another part of me and my husband, Mike, right away started to think about this can't happen. This, this, There has to be a next chapter because talent has so much to offer the community. I don't actively skateboard anymore, but I just, I know growing up in that um, environment, those experiences are irreplaceable. I felt it was important that if we had enough support to, to try to put something back to help fill the void that was left when it closed. You know, as progress started to be made and money started to be raised, it started to look like, oh, this, this might actually happen. We closed August 5th of 2018. By November of 2018, we had reestablished talent as a nonprofit and we were recognized by the state at that time. We started out doing that same driving around, looking for warehouse space, trying to find the perfect spot to reinvent talent. And then I got a call from an employee at Burton Snowboards and they were like, we have a spot inside the building that we would love you to come look at. We think it'd be a great location for talent to reopen in. And we came up with a a plan that worked for them and for us as um, our landlords and decided to make it a go. The initial design was definitely more of a kind of a data design, what skate parks were 20 years ago. And kind of, this is more of a zone based where this is more of a feature based. Uh, and been getting a lot of traction with that. And I think most people are, are really gravitating towards this design. We kind of had a couple focus groups and of, of people who grew up skating talent and were talent regulars. And it seemed like, okay, well, talent is these ramps. So let's take these. These were our favorite things that talent had. Let's take and put them in this space. I could always get it to like 60 or 70 percent, but there was always like this 30 percent that I just, this doesn't work. There's going to be this dead space or there's going to be this cross traffic that's going to be super dangerous. It just never felt right. We skated around a little bit and just came up with kind of a different idea rather than just being like these big features that kind of take up a lot of space, just having a bunch of small features, almost like having Brian Glennie put it like just taking a bunch of spots and putting them in a room. And then you can kind of use those spots however you want. And a lot of it was focused on like kind of the upcoming generation, but like what's going to be conducive to what Burlington needs right now. Excitement was building. We are going crazy, focusing on lessons and clinics and just skateboarding and community. So construction kept going and everybody was excited and people kept coming out. Cookie. Chris Colburn, he was getting a pro model. He wanted to do the release here at the skate park that he grew up in. Different locations, same feel. I'm still trying to process all those feelings that day. Talent has been there since day one for me. A lot of those people that came are the reason they stayed open for so long. It just means the world. I got to talk with as many people as I did and hug all those friends and sign boards and grip and t-shirts and stickers. For it to have my art on it means that much more, too. The ramps weren't built all the way yet. There was, instead of blue paint, there was sawdust everywhere and tools, and it was a mess, and it was perfect. It was perfect. And then by January of 2020, We finally finished everything, and the plan was to open for Martin Luther King Jr. Day with a clinic. And we ran a clinic, and it was off the hook incredible. It was incredible. Then February school vacation came around, and that was incredible. And then COVID hit. It was a whole different type of different. It was like a sci-fi movie. Now what? How do I not go out of business again when I just reopen and I can't let people through the doors? And I sat here reworking my non-retail focused business into a highly retail focused business so I could pay for things without admission to the park. 
And I spent my days driving to drop off a skateboard, a set of bearings, <laughs> a, a set of pads, whatever it was, I drove around. That's what I did. I filled orders and then drove to drop them off or people would come meet me and I put it outside on the grass. It was surreal. The setting up and the buying of your first skateboard is a magical experience because it's an adventure and you need to bring them in and experience it from the picking out of the board to standing on it to make sure your trucks are exactly perfect the way that you want them because it's such an individualized process. A kid that sets up their own skateboard values it in a different way than when they're just handed something. Chet wants to be a skateboard designer when he gets old. Oh, really? So we have camp this summer. We yeah. do that. Yeah. A summer camp for a kid is where they make their best friends and where I saw kids make their posse that they would come Saturday mornings to the beginner session to see each other, especially since a lot of them didn't go to the same schools. And then when I opened here, I actually had my first camp where there was more girls than boys in attendance. And that was just a silent little victory. Like, wow, we did it. We got the girls to come out. It's nice to see that growth, I'll tell you. Skateboard camp is more than skateboarding. It's finding your confidence. It's stepping out of your comfort zone. It's applauding somebody else's successes because you're happy for them. It's picking up a friend who didn't get what they wanted to and knowing what that frustration feels like. It's everything. I like that you can do a lot of tricks. You can even make up your own. And I think it's very fun. On Monday, I could barely do any cool tricks. And now I, on Friday, I can drop in with no problem. I would say that's probably the most exciting part for me, getting to see how quickly the kids advance and what they're learning with it. It really goes beyond skateboarding when they get up after slamming and realize that it doesn't just happen. It's not something that you can will into existence. You just have to put in the work and then get to reap the reward. Talent specifically is really important, uh, not only because it's a local skate shop. Uh, in this day and age, everyone orders stuff online. The sense of community is really hard to find. Another good part about talent is you get to design your own board. Raccoons are sometimes called trash pandas, so I did a raccoon. On the front, I have another raccoon. Talk about Cookie and Jordan, you know, there's also Marshall Heath and Dave Bear. you know, all kids that grew up in Burlington that we help just giving them a place to skate 12 months out of the year. But there's also the kids that were super good that now they're electricians, cooks, computer programmers, but they still rip skateboarding. Like, I, I, I think that's super cool. It's still a part of their life. It's still something that they do, and they're still really good at it. Talent's 18 now, so it should be able to live on its own. So my, my hopes for it is that, you know, the people who grew up being a part of it and coming to skate it will either volunteer or donate or become employed here and take it and run with it. I think our long-term goal is to, is to see it become its own thing and survive on its own with, without us. My driving force is knowing even if I'm not here on the daily operations, that talent is carried on with the values that it started with. Caring, compassion, empathy, getting kids in here who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. Give them a board, get them some safety gear, and get them turned on to something that could change their life.